Forgotten Soul, Soul Searchers Series, Book One, written by Sandra Edwards, narrated by Randy Fuller. Forward. It's a well-known fact that in 1859, two men discovered gold at the head of Six Mile Canyon in the vicinity of Virginia City, Nevada. Today, we know this great historical find as the Comstock Lode. It's interesting how the strike ended up with that name, since neither of the miners bore the name Comstock. As the story goes, a man named Henry Comstock stumbled upon the miners and said, This land belongs to me. History paints Mr. Comstock as a colorful character who had a knack for twisting the truth for his convenience. Sure, he'd owned the land at one time, but had long since sold it, some say many times over. Nevertheless, the two miners believed Henry, so much so, in fact, that they named the strike after him and cut him in on the proceeds. As it turned out, the Comstock's gold was hard mining, mostly because it had this sticky, gooey stuff all over it. It didn't take the assayers long to confirm the gold was wrapped in silver. During the 1860s, over $300 million in gold and silver was quarried out of Virginia City. It only stands to reason that there must have been some thievery going on. There are many tales about robberies and roadside ambushes during Virginia City's heyday. This story is one of them. A story about a treasure that was stolen and buried somewhere in northern Nevada where it has remained hidden for more than 100 years. The gang of thieves was comprised of three sisters from California, Maggie, Mary, and Molly Fuller. Maggie, the eldest, had strong ties to the Washoe Indians. Over the years, grand stories have taken shape about her. One of the most intriguing is that Maggie would return one day to reclaim the treasure. Believers have argued that she'll retrieve it and turn it over to the tribe as a means of restitution for all their ancestors suffered as a result of the Americanization of the West. Part 1 The Con Chapter 1 Las Vegas, Nevada Present Day Turner Atkins was up to no good. The stars had finally aligned for him, and now all he had to do was grab them. He'd happened upon the perfect scam years ago, but until recently he'd thought it was forever out of his reach. It mattered little that the scheme was brilliant, not to mention illegal. Turner needed help pulling it off, and not just anybody's help. That's where Rio Larroquette came into the picture. He'd heard all about this little hotshot. She'd been running cons around town the last few weeks, cons that he'd played as a child. She'd gotten quite the rep from what he was hearing, and Turner had every intention of shutting her down until he got a good look at her. There was something oddly familiar about her. It had taken a little time to figure it out, but once he had, he decided to give this tough little cookie a reprieve. He'd summoned her to the back office of one of his many warehouses. She was a looker, a pretty redhead, but she was too feisty to suit Turner. Inside of a week, he'd probably want to kill her more than he'd want to screw her. She was sitting across from him in one of the two chairs in front of his desk. She had her arm draped over the back of the empty chair. Looking like she owned the place, she gave him a blank stare. If she was feeling any doubt or fear, he couldn't see it. That surprised Turner, since most people were naturally afraid of him. With good reason. He hadn't gotten his ruthless reputation by being a pushover. He'd risen to power early in his career and quickly gained a name for being the most brutal gangster Vegas had seen in over fifty years. So, Rio's voice dragged Turner back to the here and now. What exactly is it that you want with me?" she asked, cool as a cucumber. He found her unruffled demeanor amusing. 
I have a job for you, he said. One that's going to pay a hell of a lot more than those two-bit con jobs you got going on all over town. I'm listening. She gave him a waving gesture with the hand that was hanging off the back of the empty chair at her side. Anybody but Turner would have missed the necessity in her tone. She wanted to get straight to it, and she didn't like waiting. Tough. She'd have to know the history to get the job. When I was a little kid, we used to visit my grandmother a lot. I can remember hearing stories about buried treasures in the hills between Carson and Virginia City. Oh, those glorious stories. When Turner was a kid, he loved listening to his grandmother spin her tales. She made it sound so fascinating. After a lazy afternoon of listening to her weave her yarns of mystery, robbery, and romance, Turner would spend the next few days with his head in the clouds, dreaming about growing up and becoming a treasure hunter. And your family history has what to do with anything? Rio's questioning voice brought him back to the here and now. Turner ignored her snarky attitude. He had to. Without her, this thing would never work. Ever since the first time I heard her tell one of her stories, he said, as if he hadn't heard Rio's inquiry. My whole life, all I ever wanted was to find me one of them treasures. He paused, as if deep in thought. I never put much stock in actually finding one, though. Not until a few years ago, when I met this woman named Audrey Tehan. She told me this fascinating story about an Indian warrior called Tehan and a beautiful white woman named Maggie Fuller. They were her great-great-grandparents, he said. It seems that Audrey's great-great-grandma and her sisters had a keenness for robbing banks, he announced with pride. During the height of Virginia City's glory, they went up there and stole a bunch of gold and silver. Rio fidgeted in her seat. Frustration tended to do that to her. It bothered her that she had worked so hard and for so long trying to create the best opportunity to build a connection with Turner Atkins. And now that she'd finally done that, hearing folklore tales was what she was left with. Turner seemed oblivious to her impatience. They buried it up there somewhere, he continued on, as if she shared his enthusiasm for the story. But they never got the chance to go back and get it. Well, now, Rio thought, we're finally getting down to the heart of the matter. Granted, this wasn't exactly what she had in mind, but she'd take what she could get just to get on his good side. Rio Larroquette, treasure hunter extraordinaire. She had to admit she liked it, but she'd never let Turner know that. She had to let him keep thinking she was the dumb redhead he'd pegged her for. I suppose there's a point hidden in your story somewhere? Turner nodded. There's a point. Mind sharing? He had to wonder how she'd ever managed to pull off a single con but it was much too late to start having doubts about her now. Rio was irreplaceable. And since that was the case, it was time to spell it out clearly and see how far this little firecracker was willing to go for a buck. My point, he said, is that Audrey told me her brother has half a map. It's supposed to lead to the sister's treasure. Okay, she said. So, what do you want from me? I want you to go up to Carson City and tell those Indians that you're Audrey Tehan's daughter. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> and then, I want you to talk them into going out and finding that treasure. You're kidding, right? She laughed at the ridiculousness of his scheme. Hadn't he noticed that her skin was whiter than white? And she was a redhead? Who was going to believe that she had Native American blood running through her veins? What about Audrey? She reminded him. She can put that notion to rest. Turner shook his head. Audrey's not going to tell them anything. And you know this because? 
Rio asked. She's dead, he said in a cavalier tone. So let me get this straight. You want me to get them to go out and look for a treasure. She brought her arms around in front of her and clamped her hands together in her lap. With half a map. Turner opened his desk drawer and pulled out a faded and worn document. This is the other half of the map. He pushed it across the desk. Rio studied it. Could this thing be real? She looked back at Turner. So what do you need me for? She laid the map back down on the desk. Why don't you just go to them and say, Hey, I've got the other half of the map. Let's go find the treasure. Turner's expression turned dark. Because I don't want to share it. It was like someone had turned on the lights, and Rio realized it was Christmas morning. You're going to steal it. Now this was more like it. With your help. And I'm helping how? She said, playing up her dumb persona. Okay, listen carefully this time. His exasperation was beginning to shine through. You're going up to Carson City to find Audrey's brother, William Tehan. You're going to tell him you're Audrey's daughter. Then you're going to get those Indians to go out and dig up that treasure. Oh, sure, she laughed. I'm going to waltz right on up there with my red-headed white ass, and they're going to believe that my mother was an Indian. They do have white blood in them, you know. Oh, yeah, Rio snorted. She hadn't fallen off of the turnip truck yesterday. And that was, what, like about a gazillion years ago? Turner returned to his desk drawer. Oh, they're going to believe it all right. He pulled out an old photograph and handed it across the desk. She took the picture, fully intending to glance at it and hand it back. But that was before she actually got a look at it. Something about the old image intrigued her. It was a snapshot of three women, and even though it was black and white, she could tell two of them had light-colored hair and the others was dark. That's a photograph of Maggie Fuller and her sisters, Mary and Molly. It was taken up in Virginia City in 1863. He paused for effect. That picture belonged to Audrey. Turner waited for Rio to look at him, but she never did. I take it you see the resemblance between yourself and at least two of the women in the shot? He pointed, singling out the girl in the middle. Especially her. She's Maggie Fuller. Rio couldn't argue that one. Not realistically. She had to admit she and this Maggie Fuller looked an awful lot alike. The whole thing was a bit eerie. She felt it as she studied the photograph, the weird sensations rambling through her. But she couldn't put her finger on it. I'll give you Audrey's personal things, including that photo and my half of the map, he said. After you locate the position of the treasure, call me, and I'll handle the rest. Where'd you get the other half of the map? she asked, her nosiness kicking in. Turner hesitated about a millisecond before saying, My grandmother gave it to me. Your grandmother? Rio had a hard time believing it. Turner was too fond of telling stories, and he'd let this one go way too easily. One of Maggie's sisters was my great-great-grandmother. Really? It was an intriguing idea, but Rio was skeptical. Which one? She tossed the photograph back across the desk. He scooped up the picture and studied it with a quick scan before pointing to the other light-haired sister. That one. She was my grandmother's grandmother. Which one was she, Mary or Molly? Now it had become a game for Rio. She wanted to see how far he could take it since she figured he was making it up as he went along. 
Oh, she could guess there was some truth to the story, at least about the three sisters. But Rio doubted that any of them was Turner's great-great-grandmother. Turner mumbled and groaned before he identified her as Molly. He was getting antsy, and the last thing Rio wanted to do was rock the boat. So, let's get to the part about all the money I'm supposed to get, she said, tremendously poised as she changed the subject. He tapped a pencil on the desk. I'm going to pay you one hundred thousand dollars. Rio threw her head back and laughed. You're kidding. She settled her eyes on him again. Right? She'd discarded his offer quicker than a blink of the eye. Not only that, she'd mocked him. He wasn't sure if that pissed him off more than it impressed him. Finally, she'd gone and done something that induced him to believe that maybe, just maybe, he'd underestimated her. He hoped so. He'd invested too much time, effort, and money to give up now. Turner had been carrying this dream around for twenty years, damn near ever since he'd run across Audrey Tejon. Now theirs had been a different kind of relationship. He'd actually liked her. Well, about as much as he could ever like any woman. Turner had never been interested in marriage or family. Apparently, neither was Audrey. He'd known exactly where he stood with her, and she'd made it quite clear what was expected of him. As long as he kept her entertained and bought her a pretty trinket every now and then, she was happy. Audrey didn't get jealous over other women. In fact, she'd told him more than once she liked it that he wasn't underfoot all the time. Then, a couple of years ago, Audrey's health started to fail. When the doctors said she had ovarian cancer, Turner was a true and dedicated friend who willingly paid her medical bills. But then again, maybe it had a little something to do with the fact that she'd told him her brother had half a map that led to a treasure. She'd gotten drunk one night, many years before her sickness, and told Turner about her family's history. Her revelation started with the story of Maggie and Tehan and ended with her own expulsion from the family. She left home at the age of sixteen and hadn't been back since. And she had these family heirlooms, items that had belonged to her ancestors, Maggie and Tehon. Turner wanted those pieces when she died and he'd played the devoted friend and benefactor, all because her time was limited. And now, if luck was on his side, and Turner believed it was, Rio was going to help him find the treasure at the end of that map. You expect me to go up there and, and con these people? Rio didn't sound committed. So you can steal the treasure right out from under them? And I'm only going to get a hundred grand out of it? Okay. Turner grinned, secretly impressed. What's it going to take? Well, the word lingered on the air. I need at least a half a mil, she said. hundred grand up front, and I'll be needing some expense money, too. All right, Turner nodded. One hundred thousand now, the rest when I recover the treasure. He studied her closely. And five thousand for expenses. Up front? She asked. Up front. Agreed. She stood and offered her hand across the desk. They shook on the deal. If you pull this off, I won't ever forget it. Oh, I can pretty much guarantee, she said. When this is over, you will never forget me. Turner sat smugly with his feet propped up on the desk. He was feeling pretty good about his chances of finally finding this treasure that was potentially worth millions. His right-hand man, Timmons, wasn't nearly as confident. As Turner's flunky, Timmons was there to do his bidding, and typically that's what he did. In all his years of employ with Turner, 
Timmons had never, not once, thrown an objection his way. And why should he? Turner paid him, and paid him well, to do what he was told. Even so, here he was, pacing the length of Turner's desk, and quite frankly it was a little annoying. What can go wrong? Turner said, without fear. Timmons stopped long enough to ask, How do you know you can trust her? And then he went back to pacing. I had her checked out. Shaking his head, Turner gave a dismissive wave. She's nothing but a two-bit con artist. He clamped his hands together behind his head. And she's not ambitious enough to steal from me. Turner's carefree attitude demonstrated his belief in what he was saying. Timmons stopped again and faced Turner. I don't know, boss. I just got a bad feeling about this one. Chapter 2 Rio Larroquette was either the smartest person in Vegas or she was the dumbest. The jury was still out. It depended on whether or not there was an actual treasure at the end of Atkins map. There was only one way to find out. It didn't take her long to pack up and leave town, heading north in her 1969 red Corvette. She'd thought about calling her friend Michelle before she left, but it was a bad idea. Michelle, who'd picked up the nickname Digger in junior high because she knew things, wouldn't let it go once she figured out what Rio was up to and she'd figure it out. They didn't call her Digger for nothing. The trip to Carson City was a good day's drive, and by the time she arrived, the sun had begun its descent behind the Sierra Nevada mountains. She scored a room at one of the motels on the south end of town. After hauling her luggage inside, she got on her laptop and sent an email. Hey, Uncle Gabe, I'm in Carson City. Never fear, things are in order. Paradise is on track and closer than you think. I just need to get my hands on that little birdie. Your loving niece, Rio. She closed the laptop and set it aside. Fleeting thoughts of food, specifically the in and out she'd seen on the way in, rumbled down to her stomach. Maybe after a quick shower she'd drop in on the burger joint and then drive by the Tejans' house. Rio knew there were two William Tejans in Carson City. William Sr. and his wife Carol, and William Jr. A background check had confirmed her theory that they were father and son. Her mind wandered off to the family. What did Carol Tejon think of her son? Rio thought it probable that Carol loved her son with all her heart. A mother's love was something Rio had never experienced. She'd never known what that felt like, but she'd dreamed about it often enough her desire for it made fabricating this fantastic childhood as Audrey Tejon's daughter an easy task. All she had to do was pretend Audrey was everything her own mother had never been. Rio had plenty of practice at that. In the bathroom, she stripped and stepped into the shower. Hot water streamed down over her and memories that she'd just as soon forget flooded her mind. Rio didn't like thinking about her childhood. But as of yet, she hadn't figured out how to prevent it, and she'd give just about anything to stop those few select memories from sneaking back in. This wasn't the first time she'd made up a mother, complete with wonderful memories of their life together. The process was like a forbidden drug she used to escape reality whenever she could. Until now, it had been a forbidden taboo, but this time she had an excuse. It was part of the job. Thoughts of her mother, well, the only one she'd ever known, crept into her mind. She used her newly created faux mother to push the bittersweet memory aside. It didn't work. Rio couldn't have been more than four or five in her fleeting recollection of being in an elevator with her parents. She remembered tugging at her father's jacket with tears in her eyes. She knew she was frightened but she couldn't remember why. To this day, she wasn't sure if she'd been afraid of the elevator or something else. Her father had told her she'd never been comfortable in elevators after that, and even now, she wasn't fond of them. 
On that particular day of Rio's childhood, her father had seen her fear and scooped her into his arms. "'It's all right, sweetheart,' he'd said, brushing her tears aside. "'You're safe with Daddy. You'll always be safe with Daddy.' Her mother's voice shrilled into her thoughts. "'Really, James, you always pamper that child.' "'Abby,' he defended his actions, and Rio, shielding her with his arms. "'She's afraid. Well, it's high time she learns that this world is not a pretty place. "'Abby, she's not even five years old.' Something in her father's voice that day, something in the way he'd shielded her, had stayed with Rio. She struggled to shake the memory. Her tears mingled with the shower spray. How could a mother be so cruel? When Rio was little, she used to think there was something wrong with her, something she'd done or said to make her mother despise her so. But how does a five-year-old warrant such malicious behavior? Her mother's constant refusal to offer Rio love had haunted her. Even now, long after the woman had abandoned her. Chapter 3 Rio popped a french fry into her mouth and checked the numbers on the houses as she cruised the residential street. 346. Great. 343 should be coming up soon. She pulled up alongside the fence, lining the yard, and rolled to a stop near the gate. The yard was modest, but well kept. There wasn't an overabundance of trees or flowers, but what was there was well-groomed and tasteful. There was nothing spectacular about the unpretentious house, but still she found it warm and appealing. After a moment's pause, she opened the car door and stepped out. Throwing her purse over her shoulder, she headed through the gate and followed the tattered path up to the porch. She paused at the door and drew a deep breath while fiddling with the strap hanging over her shoulder. Consciously aware that the bag contained Audrey Tejon's personal belongings. She exhaled in a long, slow sigh and summoned the appointed persona. Once fully immersed in her role, she tapped on the door. Within seconds, a woman of Native American descent peered through the screen at Rio and smiled pleasantly. May I help you? Hello, my name is Rio Larroquette. I'm looking for William Tejon. Which one? she asked. At first, Carol Tejon figured this was another one of her son's spurned lovers, who'd undoubtedly tracked him down here. But as she looked at her through the screen door, there was something oddly familiar about her. The girl cleared her throat. <clears> throat> the one who has a sister named Audrey. And you are? Carol was curious now, and for the moment she forgot about the sense of familiarity. I'm Audrey's daughter. Carol opened the screen door and gestured her inside. My name is Carol Tejon. She paused long enough to close the door. Audrey is my husband's sister. Where is she? I'm afraid I have some bad news, she said. Audrey died six months ago. The woman raced to the other side of the room and fumbled with the telephone, leaving Rio standing by the door. While her host made a phone call, probably to her husband, Rio eyed her surroundings. The pale walls of the small room didn't feel nearly as closed in as some might have thought. It was adequately furnished with a couch, coffee table, and a lazy boy on one side of the room, and a modest entertainment center with a small telephone table on the other. There were hand-woven tapestries and a large dream-catcher on the wall behind the couch. Rio was intrigued by their beauty. "'You'd better get home right away,' Carol's voice interrupted Rio's thoughts. "'I'm fine,' she reassured the party on the other end of the line. We have a visitor that you should probably see. After another brief interlude, Carol hung up the phone and looked at Rio. My husband, your uncle, will be here shortly. She gestured to the couch. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Rio nodded and moved toward the sofa. Can I get you something while we wait? A glass of water would be nice. 
At that moment, Carol made the connection between Rio and the strange familiarity she'd felt when she first saw her. Maggie Fuller. Rio looked like Maggie Fuller. Bill Tehan felt a sense of urgency as he hopped out of his truck and headed toward the house. Well into his fifties, he was still in good shape and had no trouble getting across the yard in a hurry. His curiosity had provided ample motivation. He hadn't a clue what this was about, but his wife wouldn't call him home for just any visitor. Bill Tehan entered his house through the front door. Rio stood, and the two eyed each other. Considering that she was a walking, talking replica of a woman who had all but been promoted to sainthood by her descendants, had it been within the scope of their religion, Bill somehow managed to keep his cool. Of course, his heart was about to burst out of his chest. He couldn't take his eyes off the girl as he crossed the room to his wife's side. This is Rio, Carol said, as the girl moved toward them, offering her hand. Bill shook it. Carol added, She says she's Audrey's daughter. About a hundred different questions fluttered through his mind, but he couldn't utter a single word. All he could do was stare at the stranger in his living room. She also has news of Audrey, Carol said with a delicate reserve. Where is my sister? Bill asked, still staring at her. Hmm, Rio hesitated and looked away. She died. She sucked in a breath, and her gaze traveled back to meet his. Right before Christmas, she had cancer. Tears pooled around her eyes. Bill's mind emptied, and his senses numbed. His only sibling was dead. Everything in him, everything he'd been taught about being a man, told him he had to remain in control. His teachings failed him. Bill stumbled toward the couch. His legs deteriorated under him like they were made of mashed potatoes. He dropped to the sofa, burying his face in his hands. Carol was at her husband's side and had a comforting arm draped around him before Rio had a chance to blink. She sat down in a chair across from them and made it a point not to look at them directly. Rio could only surmise that it must be difficult to hear about a sibling's death. In that respect, she sympathized with Bill Tehong. No matter why she was there, the man had lost his sister. It took him a few moments, but he pulled himself together and faced Rio. I haven't seen Audrey since we were kids, he said over a shaky voice. Where has she been all this time? Vegas. She never said a word. The news had left him stunned and grief-stricken. She never called. She never wrote. Once she left, we never heard from her again. An inward sigh washed over Rio. She started to feel better about her ability to pull this thing off. Sure, Turner had told her the story that apparently had been relayed to him by Audrey, but up until now, Rio had no idea of the chances of its validity. Finally, the story was starting to ring true. There had been a falling out between Audrey and her parents when she was sixteen, one that had caused a permanent rift in the family. According to Bill, there had been a boy in town that Audrey had wanted to date, against her father's wishes. Once denied access to the object of her affections, Audrey started sneaking around, meeting him on the sly. When her parents found out, things got bad, and then things got worse. Before anyone knew it, Audrey and the boy were gone. No one ever saw or heard from her again. Luckily for Rio, Bill had pretty much confirmed the story's legitimacy. But he'd been staring at her ever since he'd walked in the door, probably trying to figure out how he'd ended up with a white niece. What if he didn't believe her? Well, if she had to, she could always say she was adopted. Excuse me, sir. It was time to realize her fears or defeat them. But why do you keep staring at me? I'm sorry, he said. I really don't mean to offend you. He stood and gave her a wave to follow him. 
She and Carol followed Bill into a small dining room housing an eight-chair table and a matching hutch. Either they had a bunch of kids, or they enjoyed quaint dinner parties with their friends. Two paintings hanging on the far wall grabbed her attention. The first was of a warrior. There was no amusement painted into his face. If anything, he looked annoyed. Even so, he was handsome, and his eyes captivated Rio. She wasn't normally into guys with long hair, but like her father always said, there's a first for everything. Too bad the guy was dead. Rio amused herself with a quiet chuckle and let her eyes journey to the other portrait. It was a young white woman dressed in Indian garb. Rio stared at her. Fiery copper hair and piercing jade-green eyes. If she didn't know better, she'd swear it was a painting of herself. What the hell? Rio's head started shaking, and she didn't try to stop it as she looked back at Bill. Who are they? she asked, pointing toward the pictures on the wall. They are my great-grandparents. He gestured toward the warrior. His name was Tehon. He waved at the other painting. And her name was Maggie Fuller. Rio glanced back at her look-alike. Now that she'd gotten over the initial shock of their similarities, it hit her. She's the woman in the picture. She looked at the Tehons. My mother had a picture of her with two other women. I never knew about the picture until she died, and I went through her things. She never talked about her family. May I see the photograph? Bill asked. Sure. Rio dug into her shoulder bag and came out with a folded manila envelope. She fished around inside and came out with a small picture, offering it to him. Here. Bill and Carol studied the photograph together. Rio took a black jewelry case out of her bag. She had this, too. I've always wondered where she got it. Do you know? With careful precision, he slipped the case from her hands and eased the lid up. Seeing the intricate turquoise necklace, he bit into the gasp as it escaped. He hadn't laid eyes on it since Audrey took off more than thirty years ago. This necklace belonged to Maggie. His eyes never left the piece of jewelry. It was a gift from Tehan. You can have it, Rio shrugged, if you want. Bill, eyes still glued to the necklace, hesitated a bit before closing the case, and then, as if forcing himself, he handed it back to Rio. No, he shook his head. It was given to your mother. Now it's yours. She made no move to take the jewelry case, and he forced it back into her hands. The sound of the front door squeaking open interrupted their duel of determined wills. The Tejans headed for the living room. Rio followed. A young man, about Rio's age and just as white, was standing at the door. Killer car in the driveway, he said to no one in particular. Whose is it? I would say that it belongs to your cousin, Bill said. Billy, this is Rio. She's Audrey's daughter. He looked at Rio. This is our son, Billy Tehan. Normally, his tall frame and athletic bill would have caught Rio's eye right away, but the spark wasn't there that she usually felt upon meeting such a handsome man. The only thing about him that ran through her mind was how odd it seemed that his skin was so white, considering the darker complexion of his parents. Still, Rio didn't want to be rude. She smiled and extended her hand. Hello, I'm Rio Laraquette. It's nice to meet you. Short brown hair complimented hazel eyes that sparkled as he studied her curiously. And I thought I was the only one, he said, and shook her hand. The only one? Rio asked. Indian blood, pale skin. There was a bite in his tone, but she couldn't tell if it was directed at her or their white skin. Maybe it was her likeness to his ancestor. 
Then again, perhaps he was on to her. Chapter 4 After Rio left, the Tejans were left to make some sense out of what had happened. Bill needed to believe it was true. Carol wanted to accept it as the truth, for Bill's sake. But Billy, he needed more proof. He'd like it to be so. If it was, it meant there was another Tejan out there with pale skin, and he was no longer alone. Do you believe her? he asked his father, with a touch of skepticism and a bit of hope. The resemblance, the photograph, the necklace, which she left here. Bill pointed to the jewelry case on the coffee table. It's true. She is my niece and your cousin. And then there were all those family tales about Maggie Fuller returning one day. Billy had never put much stock in the old legends, but Rio didn't just look like Maggie. She was an exact replica. He'd heard about people resembling an ancestor, but this was different. If he didn't know better, he'd swear the portrait of Maggie was actually a painting of Rio. Once word got around about his new cousin, the girl would probably be elevated to sainthood. When that happened, somebody was bound to get hurt. Chapter 5 Rio returned to her motel room. At this point, there was nothing she could do. She'd played her card, and now she'd have to wait. That was the hardest part of all, waiting for the mark to make the next move. She knew they'd respond accordingly. They had to. Bill believed she was his niece. She'd seen that in his eyes, saddened by the news of his sister's death. And then there was that chick in the painting, Maggie Fuller. What was up with that, anyway? Rio had realized when Turner hired her that she resembled Maggie. She'd seen that in the faded and worn photograph. That's the sole reason she got the job. But when she saw that painting of Maggie on the Tejan's dining room wall, it was as if she'd seen a ghost of herself. And the warrior in the other painting, Maggie's lover, Rio couldn't get him out of her mind. Oh, sure, he was a handsome enough fellow, but it was more than that. When she looked into his eyes, she felt as if she knew him from somewhere. Or maybe she would have liked to have known him. Yep. It had been a really long time since she'd been this attracted to a man. And wouldn't you know it, it had to be a guy that had lived more than a hundred years ago. There was a knock at the door, but it didn't startle or surprise her. She pushed herself up from the bed and headed for the window. Story of my life. She peeked through the curtains. Billy Tehan. She smiled and opened the door. He gave her a sheepish grin. I hope you don't mind that I drop by without calling. It's okay. She tilted her head and shrugged. You want to come inside? She asked, taking a step back. Billy entered the room carrying the jewelry case with the turquoise necklace. My father asked me to return this to you. He offered it to her. He says he appreciates the gesture, but the necklace is yours. Your father should keep it, she backed away. I'm sure it means more to him than me. You're probably right, he said, but my dad can be a pretty hard-headed guy sometimes. He laughed softly. He's not going to take no for an answer, so you might as well keep the necklace. When she blatantly refused the jewelry case, he laid it on the table. Rio had left the necklace at the Tejans on purpose, but she didn't do it to win points. She was simply trying to give it back. The look on Bill's face when he opened the case and saw the long-lost necklace had tugged at her heartstrings. That, and something she couldn't explain, urged her to leave it there and return it to its rightful owners. After all, it wasn't really hers. She was just a con who'd been hired to do a job. Rio sat down in one of the two chairs at the small table. Billy claimed the other. You know, she said, I envy you. Why? He pushed the jewelry case across the table toward her. 
because you know the heritage and I don't. She pushed the case back. In order to pull this off, Rio had to pretend she really was Audrey Tejon's daughter, and Audrey's daughter would be trying to let the reality of the situation sink in. Audrey's daughter would have a ton of questions about her Indian heritage and her obvious resemblance to their ancestor. She was halfway there. Relative or not, her curiosity was piqued about the resemblance between herself and Maggie Fuller. She also fancied the idea of being tied to such a close-knit family that had this incredible history. She found the Tejon's ancestry fascinating. Up until my mother died, I didn't even know there was any Indian blood in me, she said with a shrug. She always told everybody she was Hawaiian. Lord knows I've had the history shoved down my throat more than a few times. Billy Tejon couldn't get far enough away from his white ancestry to suit him. It was the curse that he alone had been forced to bear. No one else in the family had been obliged to walk around day in and day out with white skin. Every time he looked in the mirror, he was reminded of the legacy that he alone had to endure. Maggie Fuller and her lust for the almighty dollar had been the curse of Tejon's death. That's the way it was in Billy's eyes. But now that Rio had shown up, he was no longer alone. Finally, there was someone else to share his burden. Oh, sure, he'd been a little reluctant to believe her at first. But his father believed her. And who was he to throw skepticism into the mix? Billy had long ago learned to trust his father's instincts, a practice that, so far, had not failed him. It sounds like a fascinating tale. Rio's tone, she hoped, was encouraging enough to get him to talk about the star-crossed lovers. Well, I guess I could fill you in, he said, if you like. If you don't mind, Rio said, I'd love to hear the story. If he was willing to share the tale with her, she was eager to hear more about the warrior. Okay, to make a really long story short, our third great-grandmother, Maggie Fuller, was white. She and her sisters, Mary and Molly, lived in Central California with their grandfather. Billy paused, glanced at Rio, then smiled. The girls were notorious bank robbers, yes, it's true. After the Comstock load was discovered in 1859, they decided to come up here and cash in. He seemed a little amused as he relayed the family's history. Rio's interest amplified. They went up to V.C. and hijacked a bunch of gold and silver as it was being shipped out. Well, at least that's the way the story goes. Nobody can agree on how much gold and silver they stole, though. Billy laughed it off. It's supposed to be buried around here somewhere, cause legend says they never got the chance to go back and get it. Well now, this was becoming more and more interesting by the minute. Billy Tejon was telling her the same story that Turner had. Was it possible? Was there really a treasure? Do you believe it? She kept her tone calm, an amazing feat considering her heart felt like it was going to pound out of her chest about the treasure being buried around here somewhere. My father believes it, he said, but he didn't sound convinced. He has half a map that was allegedly created by Maggie herself that's supposed to lead to the treasure. Billy rolled his eyes and kept his laughter to a minimum. Rio tamped down the urge to leap up and grab her briefcase. It had to look like she was considering her options. She let out a soft moan as she leaned over and grabbed the red leather attaché propped up against the nightstand. She set it on her lap and unzipped the top. Digging around inside, she came out with the small leather case that she'd gotten from Turner. She opened it and slowly pulled out the folded map. She avoided direct eye contact, peeking at him with a stealthy glimpse instead. He looked like he was buying her ruse. Good. I found this in my mother's things, she said, handing it to Billy. He took it, but made no move to unfold the faded and worn document. 
What's this? Till now I wasn't really sure. Rio returned her briefcase to the floor and leaned back in her chair. But now I think it's half a map. What the? Billy opened it up and stared at it. This made absolutely no sense. How did Audrey get a hold of this? He asked, for his own benefit more so than Rio's. Beats me. She sounded bored. I didn't even know it existed until after she died. We need to go show this to my dad. Billy and Rio went back to his parents' house, where they showed Billy's father the document. The senior Tejon retrieved his partial map from its secret hiding place and lined up the two. They were a perfect match. Can you read it? Billy's outlook had gone from skeptical to hopeful. Bill studied the map, and after a brief stretch of silence, he started shaking his head. It makes absolutely no sense at all. The map was full of hand-drawn, unmarked roads and trails and had no visible landmarks whatsoever. We just haven't figured out how to read it yet. Finally, Rio had found some optimism. Do we want to figure out how to read it? Billy asked. If they did that, then he'd feel compelled to go find the treasure, if there was indeed one. Do you believe the treasure is real? Rio asked Bill. Yes, I do. Bill said in a tone that Billy only heard when his father's mind was made up. Well then, Rio said, I say let's go find it. Chapter 6 Turner Atkins wasn't the nicest or the most upstanding guy around. By all outside accounts, he was a seedy character who was most likely always up to no good. This particular instance was no exception. He didn't care what people thought of him. He hadn't gotten where he was by being a doormat. All that mattered to Turner was that people, in general, were afraid of him, because that meant he was in charge. And damned if that little spitfire, she wasn't the least bit afraid of him. Turner didn't like it. It wasn't right. Some little two-bit con, thinking she could play ball with the likes of Turner Atkins. Inside his Vegas office, Turner was on the phone, barking out orders. Put a tail on her, he said. If Timmons is right about her, I don't want to find out about it after it's too late. Chapter 7 Billy waited beside Rio while she unlocked her motel room door. So, he said as she stepped inside. He followed her. Do you really want to do this? Damn straight I do. She tossed her keys on the table. This could take some time, you know. We don't even know where to look. He let his thoughts ramble out. If he justified it, then he wouldn't look like a weirdo when he extended an invitation to his newfound cousin. So why don't you check out of here and come stay at my place? Rio studied him with an odd curiosity lighting her eyes. I have an extra bedroom you can use, he assured her. You are family, after all. Okay. The word lingered on the air. But on one condition, she sat down at the table. You have to make that short story really long again. You're fascinated by him, aren't you? That's the way it seemed from his vantage point. Just curious. Well, then, he didn't put much stock in her reply. You'd be the first woman that wasn't. At Billy's house, he led Rio down the hallway and stopped at the doorway to the extra bedroom. It's not much, but it's free. My kind of place. Rio's smile turned on at half pressure. He gave a little chuckle and set her bags down inside the doorway. Billy made no move to enter the room. You'd better get some rest, he said. We're going up to V.C. tomorrow. Virginia City? Yes, Virginia City. He flashed a quick smile and turned away. Good night. 
She watched him disappear down the dimly lit hallway. Rio backed into the room and closed the door. She lay down on the bed, curled up, and stared off into space. Times like these, most any of her childhood memories could resurface and become so vivid as if it had happened only yesterday. The memory that came creeping out this time happened when she was about six years old. She was hiding in her room, and she could hear her parents arguing. Their yelling scared her. The sound of her mother's voice had come crashing through the walls. You and that kid, you're both driving me nuts! Rio's father's voice held a commanding tone, but it wasn't nearly as boisterous as her mother's had been. Abby, lower your voice. She'll hear you. I don't care if she does, Abby blurted out her contempt. She's so stinking needy. You're both so damn stinking needy. Rio hadn't moved from her place on the bed, except that maybe she'd drawn up into more of a fetal position. She was still staring off into space, while tears trailed over her face like miniature rivers. Chapter 8 Rio had never allowed any man besides her father to drive her Corvette. That car was her baby. But she'd gladly turn the keys over to Billy, because he knew the area, and it was a great way to gain his confidence. I can't believe you're letting me drive. There was a heady and exhilarating quality in his voice. Well, you do know your way around better than me, and besides... She gave him a gentle smack on the arm. I trust you. Rio marveled at how the town of Virginia City was still preserved in all its glory. Had it not been for the power lines and vehicles lining the streets, she might have thought she'd stepped back in time over one hundred years. There was something eerie about the place. If she really thought about it, this was the same sidewalk that people had rambled along back in the town's mining heyday. Tourists could still enter the same shops, saloons, and hotels the miners, shopkeepers, and less than desirable folks frequented back in the day. She could easily see the most level-headed people swearing they'd felt a cool, brisk nudge bump up against them as they ambled along the town's vintage wooden sidewalks, even though there was no one there. That gave her the willies. Billy parked the car in front of an old saloon that had been converted into a gift shop. They exited the car and strode up to the wooden sidewalk, merging into the flow of tourists milling along the city's storefronts. They'd all come to visit the nation's largest historical landmark. Passing by the Delta Saloon, Rio felt a chill shiver through her. She tried to shake it off, and something inside her unraveled. Her shoulders shook. The suicide table reaching out here and grabbing hold of you? He teased her with an elbow nudge to the side. Rio stopped. What? He gestured toward the saloon in a grand way. The fabled suicide table. You're joking. She rolled her eyes over him. Right? He pointed a single finger upward and a sly smile curled on his lips as his eyes shifted upward. Rio's gaze followed his to the sign hanging above their heads, advertising the now famous suicide table. Billy told her all about how the historical object back in its day was nothing more than a faro table. Over the years, many versions of the misfortunes the card table bestowed upon gamblers had grown into full-fledged legends. You want to go see it? Billy asked her with an eager grin. It's just a stupid old table. Rio was starting to feel a little freaked out, but couldn't understand why. She needed to remain indifferent. And she would, even if she had to put on a front. What's so great about that? She took a couple of steps away from him, and he followed her. You know, he taunted her with a nudge. They say that anybody who's ever owned that table has taken their own life after losing their entire fortune. He enjoyed stretching the truth. 
In truth, it was only three of the previous owners that had met an untimely demise at their own hands. Well, she said, her voice oozing skepticism, the current owner seems to be faring okay. They made their way along the wooden sidewalk. Billy couldn't resist the temptation to tease her a little more. You know, there's ghosts all over the place up here. Uh-uh. Her disbelief seemed to freeze her features into a scowl. Sure there is. He pointed to the Silver Queen, a hotel and saloon just ahead of them. Take this place up here, for instance. He nodded. There was this girl, and she was pregnant and unmarried. They stopped in front of the saloon while he spun his tail. When she realized her lover was not going to make an honest woman of her, Billy fell silent while his eyes drifted up to the second floor. She killed herself in one of those rooms up there. Rio gasped. That's a terrible story. She didn't know why, but she was bothered by the thought of some poor girl being abandoned by a shady lover. She scrutinized Billy for a moment, then said, You made that up. She spun on one heel and continued on. It's true. He followed her with mischievous laughter echoing from his throat. They happened upon one of those photo shops where they take the old-timey photographs. A twinge of familiarity brushed past Rio. Hey, she grabbed his arm. Let's get our picture taken. The desire had come from out of nowhere, but she dragged him inside with an eager enthusiasm that she couldn't explain. In no time, Rio had dressed up like a saloon girl in the Old West. The costume was sexy. She looked good, and she knew it. Parading through each room, she wandered around until she found the saloon backdrop. She hopped up on the bar and struck a pose. Billy sauntered through the doorway and strode across the studio, wearing a cowboy hat and holding a bottle of Jack. He leaned against the banister and nuzzled up next to her, resting his free hand on his holstered gun. She gazed at the camera, without much thought of anything roaming around in her mind, and when the flash went off, the light blinded her for an instant. When her eyes refocused, she was standing in front of the Delta Saloon with two other women. They were all dressed funny, in old-timey gowns. Rio felt like she was wearing about a hundred yards of material, and she had on a corset. She could tell because she could hardly breathe. She and the other women, who she thought looked a little like her, were about to have their picture taken. The camera's flash sent her reeling back to the present and back inside the photo studio. Rio looked around, awestruck by what she thought she'd seen and experienced. She wasn't sure what had happened, but that didn't hinder her nerves from making an appearance. They twisted and knotted in her gut. What the hell was that? You okay? Billy skimmed his fingers over her shoulder. What's wrong? You look like you saw a ghost. Slowly, she let her gaze travel over to look at him. She wanted to tell him what happened, but she was too spooked. Wh what happened? Billy's anxiety chased the curiosity out of his tone. It's weird, she said in a shaky voice. I was with two girls, and we were getting our picture taken, but we were outside, in front of the place where that death trap table is. At that point, she realized she'd been posing for the same picture that Turner had given her, of the Fuller sisters. I was with Maggie's sisters. She could tell by the look on his face that she'd thrown him a curve he hadn't anticipated. Billy shook his head. You need food. He led her in the direction of Muldoon's, a restaurant not too far up the street. They strolled inside, and Billy tipped his head at a couple of the waitresses and made his way to a table in the corner near the front. Rio dropped into the chair opposite him. He eyed her with a scrutinizing stare. But Rio got that. 
She'd just told him she'd posed for a picture that was taken over 100 years earlier. Who wouldn't be concerned about that? Hell, she wasn't comfortable with it herself, as shown by the way she was methodically rearranging the packets of sugar and sugar substitutes. She hadn't given the strange chill she'd gotten while walking past the Delta Saloon much thought when it happened, but now she was starting to make the connection that it had happened in the same place where Maggie and her sisters had posed for their photograph. That was a little too freaky. This place makes great burgers, Billy said, distracting her. And I think you could use something to eat, he added in a more playful tone. This is all your fault. It was going to take a lot more than humor to melt her fear. You and your stupid ghost stories. Billy chuckled and shook his head. You take everything so seriously. You need to lighten up. Yeah, she snorted. Like you, huh? What do you mean by that? Well, you're not exactly comfortable with your ancestry. You make a joke out of everything so you don't have to deal with anything. She tossed him a knowing look. Do you know how lucky you are to come from such a fantastic family? <laughs> Why? He couldn't help but laugh. Because you're in it? You don't like talking about your family, do you? They're your family, too. Don't avoid the subject, she said. Why don't you want to discuss them? What's to discuss? He'd rather avoid the subject altogether. He knew where she was headed and he didn't want to join her. Maggie and Tehon, she said. You were supposed to tell me about them. I'll tell you about them, he said. But I don't like the story. He shook his head. So don't ask me to. What's not to like? Their great love, he mocked the idea. It ended up costing Tehon his life. Would you rather they'd never met? Well, now, if that were the case, he said, you and I wouldn't be here, now would we? Ever since he could remember, Billy had always placed the blame for Tehon's death solely on Maggie Fuller's shoulders. As a direct result, he thought he should form a natural aversion for Rio, too, since she appeared, physically anyway, to be the second coming of the woman he despised. His plan failed miserably. Instead of disliking her, he found a kindred spirit in Rio. Finally, someone had come along who was just like him. An Indian trapped in a white person's body.